Well, take your Bible this morning and turn with me to the book of 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter number 16. 2 Samuel chapter number 16. And as I was sitting there, um, I remembered maybe why so many people are not here. They're afraid of the coronavirus. And um, so that's why I didn't call everybody up and lay hands this morning, just out of an abundance of caution. Uh, and I would just say, um, you know, I admire these churches. I talked to a pastor friend this week. He said, we got a staff meeting today to come up with our coronavirus plan. I'm like, I'm still just trying to figure out my Sunday sermon, you know. I mean, and, uh, but anyway, that's wonderful. So my plan is, if you're sick, stay home. And um, if you're sick, don't shake my hand, Okay. I got a baby coming any day. Some of y'all thought I might not even be here this morning. I'll tell you something else. Some of y'all surprised when you turned that live stream on Sunday night and you saw me preaching. Huh? And you said, we'll stay home tonight because pastor's not coming. And voila, he who Dean even got up out of bed and come down here and preached. Let me just say this and I'm going to move on. You know, Sunday nights are, are really wonderful. They really are. And, and I just so enjoy preaching on Sunday nights. Now you say, preacher, I get, I get you on Sunday morning. I do something totally different on Sunday night from what I do on Sunday morning. Um, a lot of what I do is just Bible study, man. I, I, don't, I don't oftentimes come in here with a three-point outline and, and a whole bunch of structure to what I do, but I'm just trying to teach the Bible. One of the things I've been doing over the past several months is I've been taking something from our readings in the week in our Bible reading, and I've been preaching it on Sunday night, but then just trying to get a grander picture of, of what's going on in, in the area that we're reading. So, hey, let me just encourage you to be here tonight at 6 p.m. We'll have service. We have great worship on Sunday night. Brother David and the musicians and the singers, they work really hard to have just as good a music on Sunday night as we do on Sunday morning. And I want to tell you something. I study as hard for Sunday nights as I do for Sunday mornings. Uh, I really mean that. Now, you say, preacher, why do we need to come twice? There's, there's no law in the Bible that says if you don't come to church on Sunday night, you're not truly saved. It'd be nice for our attendance if it was in there, right? But uh, it's not. I'll say this, we give a lot of time to a lot of things. Man, do we give a lot of time to a lot of things. Watch a lot of TV, spend a lot of time at work, spend a lot of time doing things, and people give me a lot of reasons for why they can't come back on Sunday night. I understand family time, a lot of different things. Uh, we get out every Sunday night by 7 o'clock, every Sunday night, unless we have conference usually, or when Brandon preached. Dear Lord, we stay till 7.30 that night. But every other time, we always, we always that's my father-in-law, but every other time, we always get out by 7. So, hey, let me just encourage you to make a special effort to come back on Sunday night. I don't, I don't often prod people about Sunday nights, um, I don't say much about it, but let me just say something. I, I still believe in Sunday nights, and I do, uh, uh, and if I didn't, we wouldn't have them. So let me just give, give you that appeal tonight, and uh, I'm trying to fix my iPad. I don't know. My sermon outline's upside down, and I can't figure out how to get it right side up. That's why I hate technology, don't y'all? So uh, let me say this. Uh, let, me, let me go back this way, unlock my screen. I feel like a senior citizen trying to work an iPhone. There we go. <laughs> Praise the Lord. I feel like my granddad. He types in all caps on Facebook. I said, were you mad when you typed that? He said, no, I just don't know how to get the caps lock off. <laughs> I said, well, that makes sense. So uh, anyway, you know, it's amazing what you'll find in the Bible when you just read it. How many of you ever heard the story of Mephibosheth? Mephibosheth, I mean, what a name, man. And so Mephibosheth was somebody who... Uh, was brought into the house of David, and uh, David gave him a place at his table forever. Mephibosheth was from the rival family of Saul, but David showed Mephibosheth kindness, uh, even when maybe he probably shouldn't have or maybe even wouldn't have according to the customs of that day. And I got to reading in, ahead in this chapter, and I read the first part of chapter 16 of 2 Samuel, and I said, oh my goodness, I've found something I never knew was in the Bible. Mephibosheth turned on David after he had given him a place at his table. I called my father-in-law. I said, did you ever know that Mephibosheth turned on David? He said, no, I never knew that. I said, go read 2 Samuel 16. And I thought I'd figured it out. Mephibosheth turned his back on David. 
Then I kept reading and I found it actually wasn't that Mephibosheth turned his back on David. It's that Mephibosheth's servant, Ziba, told David that Mephibosheth had turned his back on David. Now, if you say, I don't know what you just said, raise your hand. That's all right. So what I found was, literally, Game of Thrones ain't got nothing on the Bible, man. I mean, these people are just, they just twisting each other all kinds of ways. And so I just, I was learning all these things that I didn't even know was in the Scriptures. And I'll tell you another thing that I learned one day when I was reading, that there was a, there was a man in the Bible whose name was Shimmy. Some of y'all, Nelly popped right into your mind, just like it did in mine. Uh, shimmy, shimmy, Coco. Anyway, I'm not going to say the rest. <laughs> David said Coco Puffs. He's thinking about the cereal. I, I want to think that Nelly was maybe thinking about something else when he said Puff, but I, I don't know. But anyway, uh, so, so there was this man in the Bible whose name was Shimmy. Now, there's 15 different ways it's pronounced. I've heard people say shimmy I. I've heard people say Shimei, but I always, I told him this morning in my New Believers class, I said, I just always figure it, MacArthur's got to be close to right. So he says shimmy, so I'm going to say shimmy. And there's this man in the Bible whose name is Shimmy, and God uses him in the life of David to teach him something very important about two things. Number one, about how to extend forgiveness, and number two, about how to handle criticism. How many of you have ever been criticized? You know the only people who are not criticized? The people who do absolutely nothing at all. If you want to step up and do anything, you better expect that you will be criticized. I started umpiring baseball when I was in going through college down at the Little League, and I found out that every call you make, no matter if it's perfect, will endure you to some form of criticism. When you're pastoring a church, you will endure yourself to some sort of criticism. When you get married, you will make yourself available to certain types of criticism. Right? And so, criticism is a part of life. And you better learn how to deal with people who are bad about you in some way other than going off on them all the time. Right? Because that ain't healthy. So, so God, God kind of gave me this idea for a sermon series about, about the people that God places in our lives to try to teach us about what it means to be holy. And I'm going to tell you something. Anybody agree with me on this? God will teach you more by using the thorns in your flesh than He will by using the people who just tell you everything you want to hear about yourself. And so this morning, I want to preach a sermon that I've entitled this, Sometimes It Takes a Shimmy. Sometimes in your life, you need a shimmy. And we find his story in 2 Samuel 16. Now, let me just say a couple of things about this story. I've said this to you, but God uses this to teach David two things. Number one, he uses it to teach him about forgiveness. Uh, then secondly, he uses it to teach him about how to handle criticism. Now, let me say something very quickly about forgiveness. There there is true forgiveness, and then there are fraudulent forms of forgiveness. There are fraudulent forms of forgiveness. Let me give you three fraudulent forms of forgiveness very quickly before I get into this text. Number one, there's what I call if-then forgiveness. People say, well, preacher, they've done me wrong, and I'll forgive them if. If they do this, then I will forgive them. It's unbiblical. Can't do it. There's a second kind of fraudulent form of forgiveness. It's called bye-bye forgiveness. You know what I call bye-bye forgiveness? That's when you say, Preacher, I know I've forgiven them, but I'm done with them. I'm cutting them out of my life. I'll never, ever have anything to do with them again. Never forget when Johnny Hunt said this one time in a sermon. He said, Boy, aren't you glad Jesus didn't say about you, I forgive them, but I'm done with them. It's an unbiblical form of forgiveness. And then there is... A third form, and I call it maybe later forgiveness. Well, I forgive them, but I'm just too bitter right now. And maybe later we can patch it up, but just not today. If there's anybody who had to learn about forgiveness, both in receiving forgiveness and extending forgiveness, I want to tell you something, it was David. In 2 Samuel 16, David is, most Bible scholars say, about 60 years old. His family is totally falling apart. You know whose fault it is that his family is falling apart? It's David's fault. See, hear me. All tune into this. 
See, there's instant forgiveness for sin. 1 John 1, 9. But the consequences of sin can last an entire lifetime. And might I say sometimes the consequences of sin can even outlast our own duration of days on this earth. See, what we want is we want not only to be forgiven, but we want the consequences to be removed. It just doesn't work that way. So David made an intentional decision earlier in 2 Samuel to take a wife of another man and bring her to the palace and make her his own. And Nathan, who we're going to talk about next week, gave David a prophecy uh, that said that his family would be in utter turmoil and chaos. Let me tell you some of the things that happened in David's family life. He had two kids named Amnon and Tamar. Amnon was his son, Tamar was his daughter. Amnon, his son, raped Tamar, his daughter. Now you parents with multiple children, just imagine having to deal with that in your household. And the whole time David's dealing with it, you know what he's saying to himself? This is all seeds that I've planted in the ground. He had another son named Absalom, and Absalom wanted David to do something about the fact that his brother Amnon had raped his sister Tamar, and because David did nothing about it, Absalom came, became enraged. He waited for years, but his dad did nothing. So Absalom, his son, took matters into his own hands, and he killed his own brother Amnon for raping his sister Tamar. Absalom fled to his family's house north of Jerusalem. David left him there for three years, and he neither punished Absalom nor even did anything for him. He didn't tell him, come on back, it's okay. Nor did he say, you better not come back or I'm going to kill you. David just let it ride. He's one of those people who just says, oh, it'll take care of itself. For three years, Absalom was away, but finally... He comes back to Jerusalem, and David says, I'll never forgive him, and he will never see my face. And for two years, father and son live in the same city and never speak to one another. Finally, they meet, and David extends this kind of forgiveness, but it's not, it's not a real forgiveness. It's, it's, a, like a, it's like a conditional forgiveness, and, and it's not real. And so what Absalom does in his rage is he goes out, and he comes up with a conspiracy to take his father's kingdom from him and make it his own. He has so much support that David actually is forced to flee from the city of Jerusalem and run for his life from his own son Absalom. He runs from his own kingdom, Israel, looking for safety. And it is in this moment in David's life, when he is at his lowest point, that he receives from the, some of the deepest wounds that he ever receives in his life. See, is anybody in agreement with me on this? You're never surprised when your enemy does things that enemies do. What surprises you when the people that you thought were in your corner come to find out are actually stabbing the cold blade of their knife into your back. See, that, that's what shocked David. And so in this 16th chapter, two things happened that he thought would never happen. Number one, he learns from Mephibosheth's servant Ziba that Mephibosheth has turned his back on David, has betrayed him. Though it's not true, David accepts it as truth, and he is deeply wounded. And then the second thing that happens is this man whose name is Shimei comes to David from the family of Saul and begins to criticize him with some of the most awful accusations that can be leveled at him. Listen to what the Bible says. Now when King David came to Bahurim, there was a man from the family of the house of Saul whose name was Shimei, the son of Gera, coming from there, and he came out cursing continuously as he came. And he threw stones at David. And that all the servants of King David and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Also, Shimei said this when he cursed, Come out, come out, you bloodthirsty man, you rogue. The Lord has brought upon you all the blood of the house of Saul in whose place you have reigned. And the Lord has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom your son. So now you are caught in your own evil because you are a bloodthirsty man. 
Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, I love Abishai. He reacts to situations like I would. Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please, let me go over there and take off his head. A fitting solution, wouldn't you agree? David, he won't be talking if his head separated from his shoulders. But the king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? So let him curse, because the Lord has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? And David said to Abishai and all his servants, See how my son who came from my own body seeks my life. How much more now may this Benjamite? Let him alone and let him curse, for so the Lord has ordered him. It may be that the Lord will look on my affliction and that the Lord will repay me with good for his cursing this day. And as David and his men went along the road, Shimei went along the hillside opposite him and cursed as he went, threw stones at him and kicked up dust. Now the king and all the people who were with him became weary, so they refreshed themselves there. Father, help us to preach this morning with Holy Spirit anointing. And God, I pray that you would do through me in this time what only you can do. Speak through me now. Give me clarity and unction and anointing. And God, set my words on fire. I pray that the words of my mouth, the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight. O God, my strength and my Redeemer, I ask it in Jesus' name. And everybody in agreement said, Amen. I want to give you three very quick points this morning, and and I I want to just touch on a couple of things, and then I'll be done from this passage of Scripture. Sometimes in your life, you need a shimmy. shimmy. And uh, when you face criticism from these kinds of people like shimmy, I think there are three things that you need to do when you face situations like this. Number one, the first thing you need to do when you read verses 5, 6, 7, and 8 is that you need to consider the critic. You need to consider the critic. Now, who was this man whose name was Shimei? Well, Shimei was a Benjamite. He was related to Saul. You know who Saul was. Saul was the man who was the first king of Israel. He was removed from the throne because he, uh, instead of being king, he wanted to be both king and priest. And so because he did not do what God had instructed him to do, God removed him from the throne And he replaced him with a man whose name was David. Now in ancient days, when one king replaced another king, in order to secure the protection of his lineage, he would oftentimes go and kill every single member who was even kind of, sort of kin to the last king so that he would make sure that they would not be able to take a claim to the throne and try to overthrow him at some point later. But David is a merciful king. He doesn't do that. The main reason David does not do that is because Jonathan, who is the son of Saul, becomes a dear companion and friend of David. They're such close, close friends. But I want to tell you something. David's decision not to kill the family of Saul, I don't want to say it comes back to haunt him in a way that he's not right because he was merciful. But I want to tell you something. Those Saul kin folks give him pestering and and controversy for the entirety of his kingship. And that's who Shimei is. He is a Benjamite related to Saul. And he blames Saul for the destruction, or he blames David for the destruction of Saul's family and the destruction of Saul's kingdom. Now, you say, preacher, a critic is uh, okay to criticize if what they say is true. Well, Let me give you a a great proverb that you'll find in Proverbs chapter 26, verses 4 and 5. The Bible has two verses that are side by side from one another, and they um, almost seem to contradict one another. One verse says, Do not answer a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. The next verse says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. Now, did you hear that? One verse says, answer a fool. The next verse says, do not answer a fool. Now, your question is like mine. How do I know when to answer a fool? And how do I know when not to answer a fool? Well, I've always said this is the difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing something. Wisdom is doing something with what you know. 
And here's the difference in when you need to answer a fool and when you don't need to answer a fool. And you've got to learn to be wise enough to know the difference. Sometimes you need to answer a fool because to allow their ridiculous words to go uncontested is to allow their words to seemingly be true. But then there are other times when you ought not to answer a fool according to their foolishness because guess what? They got more experience than you at being a fool, hopefully. And when you try to talk with fools, guess what they usually do? Uh, they, they said in old days, they said they'll bring you down to their level and then they will beat you with experience. How many of you have encountered both sides of that equation right there? You say, preacher, I've tried to argue with fools and I just found myself to be a fool by the time I was done. And then there are other times when you uh, don't need to answer a fool. So, so David finds himself trying to practice Proverbs 26, 4, and 5 with Shimmy. What do I do here? Do I answer this fool or do I not answer this fool? Well, the, number, number, the, the first thing you've got to do before you decide whether you're going to answer a fool or not answer a fool is you've got to figure out who is this fool. And is this fool even worth answering to begin with? And I would say to you, when you look at Shimmy, you'll find that he's not worth answering. And I'll tell you this morning that most of the people who spend their time blabbering about you ain't even worth answering. Now here's the hard part nowadays. Shimmy had to show his face and answer his criticism. Now people can go behind a screen name and do it. Right? Or we got, what do we call them, keyboard warriors. They get on Facebook. And they don't actually have to speak their words face to face. They can, I mean, the stupidest thing we have in the world is a Polk County event page. I mean, isn't that ridiculous? People try to add me to it all the time. I got enough venting in my life. And y'all don't want me to start venting, right? All my church people will be exposed. No, I'm just, I'm just joking. I'm just joking. So, so you got to consider the critic. And here's the other issue. Now, I want to say this this morning, and I've, I've really learned this, and God has taught me this through patience. You need to listen to the criticism that people give to you. You may not like the person who criticizes you, and you may not like what they say, but oftentimes you'll find there's a nugget of truth in every criticism given to you. Now, here's the problem here for David. Shimmy's just flat lying, man. Somebody in here saying, yeah, preacher, that's, that's right. They all lie on me too. Ain't none of it true. Listen to what he says. He says three things. Number one, he calls David a murderer, a scoundrel, a rogue is the word that he uses here. And he says that the Lord is repaying David for all of the bloodshed that David had reaped on the family of Saul. That wasn't true. That was not at all true. In fact, David was merciful beyond anything that would have been expected of him in those days. An example of how he treated Jonathan, how he treated Mephibosheth, and how he treated other members of the family of Saul. It was an outright lie. Then Shimei said another thing that was not true. He said, you have stolen the throne of Saul. That's not true. David looked at Shimei, he should have, and he said, if you want to know who took the throne from Saul, you need to look up toward heaven and address your prayers to God because it is God who took the throne from Saul, not me. And then Shimei said a third thing which particularly cut David to his core. He said, and now because you stole the throne from Saul, God has given it to your son Absalom. Anybody agree with this? Uh, oftentimes the hardest criticisms have to do with those who are nearest to us. That cut David very deep. Cut him very deep. And David also knew that that was a lie. God had not given the throne to Absalom. Absalom had took it. Nobody was more brokenhearted over that than David. In fact, the only person who was guilty in this equation was not David at all, but it was Shimei who was violating Exodus twenty two twenty eight when it says you should not curse a ruler of your people. And I have found this oftentimes works for me. When you'll just consider where the criticism is coming from, you'll often be able to move on in victory and not even give another thought to it. But then secondly, you need to consider 
the choices. You need to consider the choices you had. David had some choices to consider here. Look at verse number 9. Everybody needs a Abishai, even if they have to keep them reined in. You know, Jesus needed James and John. There's a reason they called them the sons of thunder. Every time a city would reject Jesus, they'd just say, Jesus, you want us to call fire down on them? I mean, we'll burn them all. Some people's response when they face criticism is just to unleash holy havoc on everybody. And y'all all enjoy reading the comments on Facebook. What's the Michael Jackson meme? I'm just here for the comments, right? A lot of you, that's your Facebook life. We never see you, but you're always reading. Then Abishai, verse 9, the son of Zariah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please let me go over and take his head off. David has a particularly enticing opportunity here. With just the point of his finger, with just the knot of his head, Abishai will be on the other side of that ravine, and he will be taking care of this person who is criticizing him. Abishai was quick to want to take David's critic out. But David knew that this was not the way. Abishai, in another time, asked David to take, if he could take Saul out. David assisted Joab in or excuse me, Abishai assisted in murdering Abner with Joab in another place in 2 Samuel. Abishai was one of those people who just believed that violence is always the answer. It can solve any and every problem. And David said that is just not the case. In fact, David knew to respond to the criticism in the way that the critic wanted him to respond was only going to inflame the situation and make a bad situation a whole lot Worse. I never forget in my own time when I first began pastoring, experiencing some criticism from people not in the church but from outside of the church. And I'll never forget reading a verse where Moses was instructed, you need only be still for God will fight for you. And, and what a timely verse that was because I'm going to tell you something. I was getting my responses ready, baby. Amen? I was about to go full Abishai. I was going to tell everybody... What for? But God reminded me that those who stand in His will, those who walk in His ways, those who submit to what He desires for their life, will always have His defense and protection, no matter the enemy and no matter the accusation. You know, when we really mess things up, when we take God's word out of his mouth and make them our own, vengeance is mine, saith Blake. I will repay. I want to tell you something this morning. Anybody in agreement with me on this? God's a whole lot better at retribution than you are. Amen? He's got a whole lot more abilities and resources at his disposal. He can cause people's tires to go flat. Of course, you can too. Amen? Box of nails will go a long way. Let me give you this third one. I want to spend just a few moments here this morning and then I'll be done. We need to consider the choices, but then thirdly, consider the cancellation. Consider the cancellation. What do we do when people criticize us? Well, our response is very simple. We forgive them, oftentimes even when they don't ask for it. And the reason that we do that is because we consider the cancellation. You say, preacher, what in the world are you talking about? I want you to look at Colossians chapter number 2. It'll be on the screen if you don't want to turn there. But I want you, I'll just read you a couple of, of verses. And, and I really believe that in every situation of life, this was the thing that always brought David's center of gravity back to being in line with the Lord. David, how do you not attack every person who lauds an accusatory word at you? How do you not go after everybody who's trying to take your throne? How do you not go after all those who are trying to hurt you and harm you and attack you? David said, this is why. and Not literally, but, but, but I believe this is the idea that was in David's mind. This is what Colossians says in 2.13. And you being dead in your trespasses and in the uncircumcision of your flesh, he has made alive together with him, having forgiven you all trespasses. And then look at verse 14. 
Having wiped out, God has, the handwriting of requirements that was against us, which was contrary to us, and he's taken it out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. See, when you get to the place where you can extend forgiveness to anybody, it will be because you have come to the place where you realize what great forgiveness has been extended to you by a holy God given to an unworthy sinner. David said to himself, How in the world could I ever hold a grudge against anybody else when I realize all that God has removed from my account? He considered the cancellation. He considered the reality of his own self, that he was an adulterer, a murderer, deserved to die, yet God let him live. To take an old phrase that we use as kids, why in the world would David allow sticks and stones to affect him? when God had already pardoned and forgiven him. I didn't forget Brother Ron being here and saying, the reason that we get offended when people talk about us is because we think we have rights. We think we're important. And really the reality of New Testament salvation is that when you come to Jesus, you renounce everything about yourself. You renounce all your rights. You renounce all your privileges. Literally, they can't even talk about you. They talk about somebody who's dead. Because you've renounced all that you are. See, really, every sin gets back to a point of pride. And the reason that we can't take a harsh word against us is because we think we're somebody. You think you're hot. But I got news for you. Everybody other than my wife is not. Amen? <clears throat> right? I told her this morning, I said, you amaze me, nine months pregnant, and you look better than our wedding day. I'm telling you, it's amazing. There are times when to just be quiet is really the solution. You know, the Bible says you've got to study to be quiet, though. See, it's against your nature to, to not talk. It's against your nature to not gossip. I'm, I'm just telling you, you say, preacher, I don't gossip. I'm just... Praise God. There's one of us. It is against your nature to be quiet. You've got to study. You've got to work at it. And you've got to remember something that Bill Stafford said many years ago. He said, when people talk about you, just be thankful that they don't know all there is to know about you. See, I got, sent to the, I, got, I got sent to the principals. How many of you know Ron and Ann Ray? Ann Ray's passed away now, but she was a fifth grade teacher at Westside. And she sent me to the office one day for humming. And God is my witness. I wasn't humming. I know who was humming. Boy beside me. But she was settled that it was me humming. And I went to Mr. Thaxton. And I said, Mr. Thaxton, I wasn't humming. She says, I was humming. He said, well, just consider this one of those times where you're getting even. For when you did something that you got away with that you should have been sent up here for. <laughs> there were many of those. I said, Mr. Thaxton, I just don't like that answer. I, I mean, I just, I don't, I don't agree with that. But anyway, that was what he said. Consider the cancellation. You consider how much God has forgiven you for. Then you realize that you've got no place to hold a grudge against anybody. You've got no reason to get mad at anybody. And you know what David did to Shimei? Go to chapter 19 of 2 Samuel and you'll find how this story concludes in David's life. The Bible says that Shimei, the son of Gera, fell down before the king when he had crossed the Jordan. And he said to the king, Do not let my lord impute iniquity to me or remember what wrong your servant did on the day that my lord the king left Jerusalem, that the king should take it to heart. For I, your servant, know that I have sinned. Therefore, here I am, the first to come today of all the house of Joseph to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, there he is again. Shall not Shimei be put to death for this because he cursed the Lord's anointed? David said, what have I to do with you, you sons of Zerai? You always wanted to kill everybody. That you should be adversaries to me today. Shall any man be put to death today in Israel? For do I not know that today I am king over Israel? Therefore the king said to Shimei, You shall not die. 
and the king swore to him. Feels good to just let it go. See, bitterness and resentment and unforgiveness never forgives, it never holds the person captive who you're not forgiving. You're the one who always suffers for not extending forgiveness to those who have wronged you. Let me give you the saddest conclusion to this story. It is that when David was coming to the end of his life, though he had extended that forgiveness to Shimei those many years ago, as he's laying on his deathbed, he allows that bitterness and resentment to crop up in him again. And look at what he says to Solomon in 1 Kings chapter number 1. His son who's taking the throne. Chapter number 2. I mean, this is sad right here. The days of David drew near that he should die, and he charged Solomon his son with a whole host of things. What do you do when you die and you, you draw your family near, your sons and your daughters and your grandchildren? You give them some final words like Jacob did. You bring them all together like Joseph did in Genesis chapter 5. It's a time of, of, of mourning, but then it's also a time of celebration. I mean, you, at, at this time of all times, you, you're letting bygones be bygones. David's laying on his deathbed, and here's what he says in verse number 8. And see, Solomon, you have with you Shimei, the son of Gera, a Benjamite from Bahurim, who cursed me with a malicious curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by the Lord, saying, I will not put you to death with a sword. Now therefore do not hold him guiltless. For you are a wise man and know that you ought, what you ought to do with him. And bring his gray hair down to the grave with blood. At the end of his life on his deathbed. I love old David. He was a man after God's own heart. But, and that's a sad indictment on him. Laying on his deathbed. Solomon, you remember how I forgave Shimei. Now there's a new sheriff in town. There's a new king on the throne. Don't you let him get away with what he did to me. You bring his gray hair to the grave where I'm at. Make his blood be spilt. You and I have to constantly guard against the roots of bitterness in our lives. I taught him this morning in our New Believers class, there is something in my flesh that causes me to want to hold everything against everybody all the time. Until I remember, number one, what great forgiveness has been extended to me. And then I remember what Jesus said. Jesus said, forgive those who trespass against you. Just as your Father forgives you of your trespasses. Because here's what Jesus says. Jesus says, the measure of forgiveness you give to others. See, you don't hear this a lot. The measure you give to others is the measure by which forgiveness will be given to you. Did you see that? Jesus said, how you deal with everybody else horizontally... That you'll be dealt with by God. And we're a lot like that parable, that man in the parable, aren't we? We've been forgiven of such a great amount, and we run around holding grudges over people for petty little matters. And Jesus compares us to a man who had a great debt, and it was forgiven him. And he runs out and finds every person who owes him a penny and says, Pay up! And on his deathbed, David just couldn't let it go. And you know what I know that's true about this room this morning? There's people in here in this room who have things in their heart that they have not let go. You need to extend forgiveness. You may need to extend somebody, forgiveness to somebody in this room. I don't know. You may need to extend somebody, forgiveness to somebody in your family. 
And I want to say something to you very clearly and boldly. Number one, until you do it, you'll never be right with God. You will not be right with God until you deal with it. Number two, I want to say to you, remember this morning, the cancellation of debt that's been given to you. Sometimes God uses those people in our lives to remind us of what great forgiveness He has extended to us. Remind us that we're, in the grand scheme of things, just not all that important. Even David, the king of Israel, was just another man. This show and this story is about God and nobody else. Sometimes it takes a little criticism to remind you that you are of the dust and you will return to the dust one day. But don't let bitterness rob you of the joy that you have in the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to pray for us, and we're going to stand in just a moment and sing. Maybe you need to deal with those things in your heart today. Hey, I'd encourage you today to be a great day to do it. Deal with the unforgiveness and the bitterness that is in your heart, and allow God to give you the freedom that you need to overcome these things. Father, during this time of invitation, I pray that you would work in our hearts and our lives, and God, move in us. Allow us to get free of the sins that do so easily beset us, one of those being bitterness and unforgiveness and resentment. God, everybody in this place at some point in their lives would be subject to criticism. God, I pray that you would help us to understand that we have no rights, we have no privileges. We renounced them in salvation. And you now flow through us. You live your life through us. So when people attack us, truly, Lord, they attack you. And you will defend us. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. Our job is to say, as Jesus said on the cross, of his accusers who were literally in that moment putting him to death, Father, forgive them. God, I know no doubt there are some people probably in this room who God, bitterness and unforgiveness is robbing them of having the relationship with you that they need. I pray, Lord, that you would help them to deal with that. God, I know that there are times in our life where people just deeply wound us and it's not easy to get over. God, I pray that you would help us to get the victory that we need. Because we have victory in Jesus Christ. Move in our time of invitation. If somebody here today is lost, I pray that today you would save them through your marvelous grace. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand and sing this morning. Uh.